And we are back with another edition of How About Them Celtics Talk and Seas with Bobby Kravitzki of SI Media Group. Bobby, how are you doing today? Doing fantastic. Looking forward to All-Star Weekend and seeing what's in store for us. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Good All-Star Weekend cool <laughs> means a little bit of a break from the Celtics, but that doesn't mean we're taking a break from the Celtics. We're here and we're still going to talk plenty of Seas action where do you want to start, Bobby? Let, let a wide range of stuff. There's no games to cover, so we can start wherever you want. So is there anything in specific you want to start about, uh, start talking about uh, to kick off the show? Yeah, I think that we're coming up on the home stretch of the season. And with this being a natural recess, it makes sense to pause and reflect and talk about, OK, what stands out to us from a positive and a negative perspective? So from a positive light for the Celtics there are two things in particular I mean there's there's a whole laundry list but two that I'll go with right now that stand out one is the growth of Joe Missoula and I think a lot of that has to do with not only experience he got thrown into the fire last year right before media day in training camp and now he has since had a year that included going head-to-head in a seven-game playoff series with Eric Spolstra so there's the growth that comes from that but also He's no longer in survival mode. He's gotten to place his imprint on this team. He got to fill out a coaching staff for the first time, and he was able to get Sam Cassell and Charles Lee, two of the league's top assistants. In the case of Charles Lee, there were two instances where he nearly became a head coach last summer. So to have a staff like that to lean on in this collaborative approach of his is invaluable. And then also what you see from him in terms of we've talked about just having his finger on the pulse of the team and, okay, This is the messaging, especially when it comes to mindset and mentality, that I need to drill home. I think he's at the root of the the win-the-day mantra that they've adopted that has really served them well this season. You heard Kristaps Porzingis credit them for. They showed up for that last game before the break, and Brooklyn didn't. And he said it had a lot to do with Joe Mazzulla making sure that they were ready to go and they weren't looking ahead to vacation. And then secondly, and I'll be brief with this one, is that this team has improved so much compared to even just last season when it comes to quickly and consistently making the right reads. I think Derek White has made a leap in that front. I think Jalen Brown has obviously experienced the biggest jump. And so that is a factor that is really going to be crucial to their success come the playoffs. Yeah, I mean, I like a lot of the growth we've seen from this team this season. You you see the Celtics being much more consistent on offense because they have more layers to their game. I know we had the whole perk talking point here over the last week of they don't post up enough. They shoot too many threes. That's the only thing they do, but that's not the case anymore. If perk said that over the summer when this team was coming together, it would be a little bit more valid, but they are what second in the league in post-ups behind Jokic and the boys there in Denver. And generating and they are the very efficient when they do. Them. Yeah. Like, I I love the post-up game. Jack, all summer, all I talked about was when Porzingis got here. I was like, this is going to rule. They're going to post up. They're going to have another late game weapon to use. And we've seen them play a lot better in close games. There have been close games they've lost, for sure. But it does feel like they managed to get themselves over the finish line more often than not this year. And that's just not something I think we could feel last year at this time. We were worried every time the game was close in the playoffs. I don't think I ever felt comfortable when the Celtics were in a dogfight. The only time the Celtics were beating teams last year and the year before is when they were absolutely steamrolling them. And that happened a lot, and the Celtics were still a good team. But this season feels different because they're actually pretty good at closing games. Miami, the the win in Miami is my favorite. They couldn't get shots to fall. They played defense. They focused regardless, and they got past Miami, a gritty team, and took the win. So love the mental growth we've seen, to your point, Bobby. Uh, this team is ridiculously good. Like, like, I feel like we take for granted how dominant this Celtics team is. It is the all-star break. They have, let me count, four more wins than any team in the NBA and seven more wins than any other team in the East Yeah, at the all-star break. Like for all of the fair criticisms, for all of the concerns you've had because this team hasn't won a title yet, for all of the you know, nitpick things you can look at. They are far and away the best team in the East and pretty clearly the best team in the NBA. And from what we've seen so far, the only thing that really gets in their way, there's a couple things. One, which is something I think they've gotten over so far, 
I think really physical defense gets in their way a little bit. You saw it in the Timberwolves game early on in the season. You saw it in that Thunder game when they really get mucked up on the drive and it ruins their driving kick game. I think that messed with them a little bit to start the year. But I think they've gotten a lot better at it lately. Um, outside of that, like it's just them getting in their own way and staying focused. Like It feels like the games they've lost were because they just didn't feel like focusing that day, which I'm not saying is a good thing, but I don't think that will be as much of an issue when the games matter a ton. Like it does feel like they came out so hot because they're like, all right, let's get off. Let's, let's get off to a big, you know, start to the season. And then they've sort of trickled off in terms of mindset. Cause they're like, all right, it's playoffs time. Like, is it playoffs yet? Like what, like TikTok? What, what do we need? What are we playing the playoffs? Even their away record. Like we were looking at their home away record and they were undefeated at home. And they were like, I don't know, six and four, six and five away to start the year. They're 17 and nine on the road now. Like, like they've, like they, they've surged there too. So it's like, the, they are when they are playing at full strength with fully healthy roster um, and are locked in on both sides of the ball. I know it wasn't the perfect example because the Nets aren't a very good team, but like the defense they played against the Nets in the first quarter, they, there was nothing the Nets could do. Like, like it was <laughs> so th- that's that's my best takeaway uh, in terms of the first half of the season. Curious to know what you guys think of the, uh, I suppose, the worst, although it's hard to say worst when they're this good. So, but yeah, I am curious and I especially want to get Sam's take on that. But what I'll just say quickly before throwing it over to him is that to one of the points you made there, Jack, it's why I think it's so important that after the All Star break, yes, it's about experimentation and and pacing guys and, and getting them rest, making sure they're fresh for the playoffs, but you also can't stray from continuing to build on winning habits and and not squandering a day. And so that's why I don't want them to be this team that was great until the all-star break and then took their foot off the gas to any extent where it led to, uh, it was detrimental come the postseason. So I think it is important that they continue to build on the foundation that they've established to this point, rather than just completely you know, ease up and start going from if they were driving 80 miles per hour to tick it all the way down to 50 is a little too low. Yeah. I mean, if, if you want me to complain, you got it. Uh, so one thing, and this has been a lot better the last couple games that I would like to see them do more consistently is play defense and lock in on that end of the floor. The Celtics this year have been an offense heavy team, which is fine. It's great that they can put the ball in the basket it's great that it's felt like they've been more consistent than they ever have been. The problem is, is they will go on these absolute scoring outbursts. They'll score 70 and a half and they'll look up and only be up single digits. Like if you are putting a hammer down on the opposing defense, you need to capitalize on that. You need to build up a lead. They were against Washington last week and they barely had any kind of halftime lead. Actually, they were losing at the half to Washington. Atlanta was the team. They barely had a lead on at the half. And they had 71 points. Play defense. Be serious. Now, perfect example, the Nets game, which they won by 50, and they obviously aren't going to win by 50 every day. But we we saw how much they can build a lead just by playing defense at the same time as playing good offense and letting that defense lead into good offense. It's not going to be perfect. There are going to be off nights. But I would like the defense to be more consistent. I feel like there have been several games this year where they haven't been able to get a stop for quite some time. There are just stints where it's just like, it's the, it's the guy at the uh, turnstiles. I think it's a European soccer game. He's barely even patting people down. He's just like, yep, you're good. You're good. And just letting everybody in. That's what the defense looks like at times. OKC is a game in particular that sticks out to me. It was a game that they almost came back and won, despite being kind of putrid the whole time. And it was because they didn't play defense in the third quarter. At least they didn't get stops. There was probably a five-minute stretch where it was just basket after basket after basket. And it was tough. So when the playoffs roll around, lock it on defense. Make that your calling card. And not let the offense be found money. Uh, I think the defense has been pretty good this year. Uh, I agree with the concept that like there have been stints where they have slowed down. I also just think that – I mean, I asked them about it after the game, like, it happens like, like it's going to happen. It's 82 games. They're not going to be perfect all the time. I think expecting perfection is irrational. I'm not saying that's what you're doing, but like it's going to happen. It's just a matter of, of locking back in. I think what concerns me more or not even concerns, but like what I look for more is 
the I think the transition opportunities thing is more important because I, I think that's less of a matter of opposing defense. Transition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When they let opponents like the Washington game, like that was sure. what Good are you point. doing? That that was unacceptable. So I, I think that's more of the thing. Like you can mess up defensive execution. You can have miscommunications on defense where you know, the other team is able to slip through the cracks. You can have off nights where where you're you're lapsing a little bit. But when you're letting a team score 20 points, 30 points in transition in the first half, that has nothing to do with an off night. That's just you not trying. And so I th- I think those are the things I love it. that are, are more concerning to me. Because I think, I mean, the defense is third in the league right now. And the offense, no, it, offense it, yes, is first. bad but. by any means. <clears throat> But it feels weaker than the offense, don't you think? Like you feel like the offense is like just perfected for the I don't most think part. But, yeah, they but I don't think that's I don't think that's it's weaker so the defense is bad. I think that's the offense is just obscene. Like and I don't also, think that's the reflection of how I think it's like, a part of I, I think it's a part of today's NBA where I'm not surprised that they're better offensively than they are defensively. I think that applies to most teams, especially at the top of the league. And also I look at a number of the games that were referenced just now, especially Washington, and say they didn't show up that night. And that's going to happen. You know, you want to minimize them, but it's one of 82. And it's a Friday night where, for whatever reason, fatigue, all that, they they even admitted afterwards that they looked at Washington and was like, okay, like we can kind of coast through this one. And look, they went full throttle for 12 minutes, and you would have liked the fourth quarter then to win comfortably and put them away. That didn't happen, which is interesting. But ultimately, they did get the win on a night where they honestly didn't really show up. Yeah, I mean, like you said, they won, which was great. And the fact that they were able to just turn it on and dominate the third quarter. I think they gave up, what, 14, 16 points in the quarter. Like It's exactly what you want to see from the Celtics. So the fact that they have a switch that they can flip and you can see it happen mid-game is a really positive thing. I don't love having to rely on them to flip a switch in the playoffs, but to know that they have another level that they can get to is pretty great. Definitely. Um, yeah, I, I think they've been pretty good this year. Chad is is popping. Chad is active now. Hello, Chad. How are we doing? We are live. We're going to be live Mondays and Fridays uh, for the most part for talking seas. Um, where do you want to go next, Bobby? Again, you can kind of jump around here because it's, it's you no know, games. There's no real order we have to go in. Yeah, I, th- I think there's a whole bunch of different items that we can get to here. So one of them for me is going to be coming out of the break, the integration of Xavier Tillman and Jaden Springer. And I'm really curious to see what that looks like, how many minutes they get. It's going to go inside with pacing some players ahead of them in the rotation. So it, it'll be interesting. But look, th- they have ingredients individually that suggest they'll be able to come in and hit the ground running with Tillman. We're talking about a veteran, a high IQ individual who's a really good and versatile defender and effective screener and facilitator. That's something I spoke to Joe Missoula about, and he was very complimentary about Tillman's play at both ends of the floor. And he talked about how important it is that their bigs do an excellent job of making the right screen reads. And that's something that's a box that Tillman checks resoundingly. So I think that he'll be able to come in and play well. And along with having the break, Jaden Springer is a dog out there. He's someone who that motor does not stop. He's relentless and he makes his bread on defense. And so I think he's someone that's going to quickly endear himself to Celtics fans. And when that's your style of play and it's far less about what's happening at the offensive end, at least right now and on this team in particular, I think it suggests that he'll be able to acclimate quite smoothly yeah i mean i'm on the same page as bobby here i think both these guys are really good celtics like they just play the way that the fan base really likes to see they both play hard tillman is going to be somebody that's more of a rotation guy i think than springer will be at least right now he has the wiggle room to carve out a role off the bench because the celtics are actively kind of looking for that third big guy and i know john in the comments mentioned the playoff rotations to fill in and be able to play in the big spots. And even in these back-to-back games where one of Horford and Porzingis is always out, they usually don't run both those guys on the both legs of the back-to-back. So there's going to be plenty of opportunity for him to get in there. I'm excited to see how switchable he is on defense. I've heard all the great things that everybody told Jack about him when the trade happened. Jack went around 
talked to some Grizzlies reporters and they gave him a ton of good info on Tillman. It sounds like we're all going to love him. So I'm pumped. I I'm excited to see if his offense goes to another level within the Celtics team, because Memphis was a good team last year, had good pieces out there, had good initiators, but this year with Ja out, they didn't have as many different guys that can pick on defenses, put pressure on them and Tillman, his field goal percentage really, really hurt from it. He was only at about 41% as a big guy, which is not what you want to see. But on the Celtics, somebody like Luke Cornett, who has a similar offensive skill set to Tillman, was shooting or is shooting almost 70% from the field. So if they could put him in that role, he could very well thrive on the Celtics. I'm very excited for Xavier Tillman. I think he's going to be a really good player for this team. I was telling Bobby before our last game we were just talking, I said something along the lines of like, I think he could be the eighth best player on this team by the start of next season. He's great defensively, a little bit smaller, but it makes him switchable. Great rebounder for his size. Can guard bigger guys. He can guard AD, Jokic, Giannis, Spam, like John is saying in the chat. Absolutely. Like he has a reputation for being able to guard those guys. Um, And having that on a team that is going to have to go through, maybe not this year for them, but Embiid and Giannis and those guys in the playoffs is huge. He's a great screener. I think his touch around the rim is going to look a lot better with the space he'll have in Boston. I don't think he'll necessarily jump in directly ahead of Luke Cornett. I do think that once he learns the defensive schemes, he'll probably play over Luke Cornett. Um, I just think he's a better player overall. He's probably more skilled. Um, and on top of that, three-point shot looks all right. <laughs> Not saying he's going to take a bunch, but I know he can, and he has in the past. So I'm hoping they're a little more open to allowing him to shoot threes. As far as Jaden Springer, I don't know if either of you guys got to him yet, but we can we can go around the horn with that too. Like, I don't think he'll play as much. I think they value shooting a lot at the non-big man position. I think that's – I mean, the big man position is really the only spot where they have non-shooters on the floor ever, and it's just Luke Cornett and sometimes Mia Shkeda. Um, And so having a guy who's not a great three-point shooter is probably not going to happen a lot. The only time I could see him getting on the court um, – is what Carl said here. When PP can't guard, trigger a play. Uh, and so if they need somebody to go in, play some intense point of attack defense off the bench, I think they could get him in there. That said, that's why they have Derek White, Andrew Holiday. Like I, I don't, I don't think he'll get in a ton of run because when they do need defense at the guard spot, they have probably the two of the three best guard defenders in the league on the team. So I don't know if Springer will be the go-to. I think he'll get some chances in the regular season, but I don't think he'll play in the playoffs. Tillman, I think, has a chance to play in the playoffs. So, Yeah, wholeheartedly agree with that. And then I also look at another player because Springer is more about the long term. He's under contract for next season, and he's probably not going to price himself out of Boston, even with the payroll and the second apron being what they are. And another individual who is more about the long term is Jordan Walsh. And we got to see more of him against Brooklyn on Wednesday night. And it was obvious that there was some nervous energy there, some jitters. This is his first legitimate chance for NBA rotation minutes. But I still think there were a lot of positives out there just in terms of the traits and how active he was defensively. I thought he set some effective screens, most notably when he cleared a runway for Derek White to step into a pull-up jumper that he knocked down. He got a block, a steal. He had five rebounds. So there were still positives there. And from Joe Mazzulla to members of the front office to players on the team, he has earned a lot of praise for really important assets that will serve him well in his development. And it stems from his discipline, his commitment when he's in Maine to playing in the role that resembles what he'll have in Boston, to his work ethic, to how quickly he picks up and then applies information. So when you're 6'7 with a 7'3 wingspan, you're light on your feet and you can be just this havoc wreaker defensively who's good on the glass and able to push the ball and likes to facilitate, there's a lot of upside for Jordan Walsh, who's only 19 and definitely factors into Boston's long-term planning. Yeah, Walsh is somebody that certainly has a ways to go physically. If you just look at the rest of the players when he's on the court, he is much, much skinnier. Um, but... To his credit, he talked a lot after, what was it, Wednesday's game against Brooklyn. And he was like, listen, I, of course, was like kind of nervous. He was talking about how he tried to calm himself down. 
But he was like, look, the, the bottom line is I want to go out there and represent the uniform correctly. I want to play hard. I want to play like a Celtic. I want to give the fans something to respect about me. And despite not putting the ball in the basket, he did that. Bobby mentioned the box score with five rebounds, a couple of blocks, steal. He was running the floor, playing hard. And that's why I think the crowd at the Garden loves him so much. They can tell his mindset is right. He's committed to being a winning player. He has become a media darling. He's just somebody that seems to be well-liked by everybody who's interacted with him. And it makes it really easy to root for him. Plays hard. It's what you like to see. And up in Maine, he's shooting the three as well. So you know he can do that. I'm curious to see how he's going to develop. Summer League should be a lot of fun with him. And even after the All-Star break, I'm sure there's going to be spots where it's a Jordan Walsh night, maybe. Definitely. I, I mean, I think the Celtics drafted this guy for a reason. I think they had their eye on him for a reason. He's going to be a part of what they do. Like it, it, As the CBA gets more, makes it more and more difficult to build a roster and add quality pieces to a roster, you need guys on small contracts that are able to give you real minutes. They signed him to the, with the, the second-round exception. He's under contract for this year and then three more after it, I believe. Like he's going to be around if they can develop him even into in, like even a low level three and D player where he's playing 15 minutes a night, 20 minutes a night. Like that's a win. He's under contract through the 26, 27 season. And that year he makes $2.4 million. Like it's nothing. So if he can shoot 36% from three, play some tough defense, like he'll get minutes on this team by then because they probably won't be able to resign some of the guys that they have on the roster right now. Um, so yeah, that's what I'm looking for for D Walsh or J Walsh. I should say I was stuck between him and Derek White, but uh, well, the D yeah, works because he's, he's going to make more of his bones on defense. As much as True. the development of his shot matters for his ceiling, it's about defense more than anything being his path to playing time. Hundred percent, hundred percent. All right, well we can go on to some All Star talk, I suppose. Uh, we got a bunch of events this weekend. I think maybe two the Celtics actually care about, or the Celtics fans should actually care about. Um, but we can go over them all. Uh, dunk contest. I, I think we should start there, obviously, uh, for clear reasons. We talked about it briefly last pod, I believe, Bobby. Do you think Jalen Brown could win, or do you think it's just going to be, yeah, Mac McClung's going to clean up? I think Jalen Brown could win. I think he's going to prove a lot of the doubters wrong. I, I think that there's going to be some dunks in there, especially – when he involves props or there will be one with Jason Tatum. They've both talked publicly about that. So they haven't officially announced that, but they've let you know it's coming to so be surprised if it doesn't at this point. I, I think that there's going to be some dunks that look a lot different than his in-game profile in that regard. And I look at the field. I'm not particularly impressed. I know Jacob Toppin has some bunnies and we'll see what he does. I think Jaime Jaquez comes in last as much as I love him. And I also look at something we talked about the other day, and that is Mac McClug needs this. this. This is what he does and what he has going for him. So I think that Mac McClung is going to successfully defend his crown, but I do, I wouldn't be surprised. And I, I'd even be willing to pick Jalen to come in second. Although I wouldn't be surprised if in Vegas, more bets are coming in on Jacob Toppin to do so. Not that anyone bets on second in the dunk contest. <laughs> Just put your house on Jacob Top <laughs> to get the silver. They go to mortgage. Uh, I'm excited for Jalen. I have been on the Jalen the dunk contest train ever since the announcement started to trickle out. I think this has been something he's been thinking about for a long time. I just I feel like he got himself ready. Like I keep saying it, I think he worked out his material. We've heard he has six dunks prepared, and he is absolutely ready to put on a show. He has he has the athleticism for it. He has the star power for it. I'm sure he's going to get his teammates involved. I know we heard about Tatum uh, probably going to help him out in some part of this dunk contest. But I'll be rooting for him. We haven't had a Celtic in the dunk contest for, what, 15 years now? No, 17 years. I don't know how long it's been. It's been a long time. Uh, I'm, I'm excited to see Jalen in there. I think he's going to do better than a lot of people think. I'm kind of surprised with the – I don't know if Jalen's going to do good. I think he is. I think he's a good dunker. 
I think he has a chance. I just think, like Bobby said, this is Mac McClung, McClung's full time job at this point. You need to win the dunk contest, or you're a failure. Like that is this is what you do, brother. Come on, get it, get it cooking. That's all he's been doing for the last year is just dunks. He needs um, like Jeff Ross is the roast master. It's the only time you see him. The same applies to Mac McClung in the dunk contest. Who is even in the three point contest? I don't know if I know. Everybody that's uh, not Sam Hauser. <laughs> Malik Beasley, Jalen Brunson, Halliburton, Lillard, Markinen, Mitchell, Towns, Young. That stinks. That's not fun at all. I don't even care who wins. Like <laughs> Malik Beasley got in because he knows Chris Haynes and politics, and then everyone else is a superstar. Like, what are we doing? Like, that's lame. I want it to be the best three point shooters, not oh look at the stars. I don't care who wins. Um, as is far Hauser as the only person that you would want to add, or is there another name that comes to mind? I said this last year. I think the three point contest should take the top eight three point shooters by percentage who qualify. That is the three point contest. And if they don't want to do it, go next on the list. It is the only like objective selection process that you can have in the NBA, like all stars subjective, dunk contest subjective. You literally have a list that tells you who the best are. What are we doing? Like, let me let me take a look here. The three point contest should be. Let's see. I, I can I can tell you my unbiased opinion because there's a list in front of my face that tells me exactly who should be in the three point contest. The three point contest, based on people who are eligible, should be Grayson Allen, Luke Kennard, Kawhi Leonard, Norm Powell, Jalen Williams, Aaron Neesmith, Malik Beasley, Kevin Durant. That should be a three point like contest. That. It's a nice blend. It's objectively. And when Kawhi and KD inevitably say no, ask Mike Conley. And when somebody else says no, ask Sam Merrill, who has been murdering in cleveland this year when somebody says no drew holiday then ask towns then ask walker like just go down the list it's not that hard guys you have a list in front of you of people who qualify and if you want to add the the asterisk of oh at least five attempts fine then just do that <laughs> like it's so easy just go down the list and find the best shooters and ask them to be in the three-point contest it doesn't make sense to me that that's not the process of asking these guys so whatever I co-sign that. I will also, with that said, predict that Larry Markinen wins the three-point contest. Mm. Sure. I can buy it. Yeah. I think it'll be him or Trey Young. Um, but we'll see. Uh, we'll see who comes out on top. Sure. All right. All... How did two bucks get in there? Uh, they don't really have much else to play. for. <laughs> it's true. This is true. Um, lastly, the actual game. East versus West again. Tatum won All-Star Game MVP last year. Who wins this year, Bobby? Ooh, it's a great question. You know, it, it's all about who's the hungriest to get that award. And once someone starts cooking, then people will get out of the way in the third quarter and then see what's unfolding in the fourth. And so if the game's not competitive or if someone is just absolutely dominating, those lend themselves to someone getting the all-star game MVP. So, I still want to marinate on this. I'm curious what you guys have as predictions. Because to me, there's not a name that jumps out where I say, I'm putting my money, I'm going to the window, I'm putting some pizza money on this individual to win the All-Star Game MVP Sunday night. I think this is a great opportunity for Halliburton to win it. Home fans, like home mm -hmm. arena. Uh, Gerald's saying that he thinks it's going to be Tatum because he's trying the hardest. I think Halliburton's going to try the hardest. He's at home. He has to represent the Pacers. I think it's a really good opportunity for him to do that. Uh, he has played really fun basketball this year. He has the potential to be a big-time scorer. He can set his teammates up in really fun ways. Like, I just think he's going to put on a show, and people respect him for it. I'm not really sure the East has the best roster, though. So there could be a big-time, like, they're, not gonna, they're just not going to win. So he can't win it. West, yeah. I could see a chip on the shoulder, uh, Curry coming off the bench, maybe shooting a bunch of threes, putting on a show. I don't know, probably not Tatum again. No, I don't think Tatum again. I, I think it'll be Shea or Luca. I think one of those guys oh. is gonna get a bunch of buckets and then win. I, I don't know who it'll be, I don't know which one of them is gonna go off first, but I, I think one of those two guys is gonna maybe not care about win it like a lot, but like subconsciously, like, yeah, that'd be cool to win. So, I think it'll be one of those two young guys. So I'm so glad you said that because I do, I feel the most comfortable picking Shea. And look, the reason we're not talking MVP today, we did it on our last episode on Wednesday. So you can go back and check that out. We discussed where Tatum belongs in that conversation. I, I again, 
Shea is probably who I'd go with for All-Star Game MVP. So if we're putting these down as official predictions, that's who it is for me as well, SGA. But I could see Devin Booker being the guy that, even though he's not starting, he gets hot on Sunday night. And I could also see Anthony Edwards taking over this game. So those are two people who might not be as high in terms of the odds that Vegas gives them. But I I could see either one of them, Devin Booker or Anthony Edwards, coming away with the hardware. Yeah, I think any of those guys have a chance. Uh, All right, let's catch up with the chat a little bit. We've neglected you for most of the stream. Mm. Um, Antonio a while ago said, do you think Tillman will be a sub of Horford in the future? In other ways, do you think they can move preparing the end of the Horford era? Uh, I do think he has a chance to sort of replace what Horford brings to the table. I think they're very similar skill sets. Um, I don't think he's as good as Horford, and I don't know if he will be, but I, I do think you can see the vision for him replacing him in the rotation eventually once he retires. Yeah, I totally agree. I think that you can't expect to replace Al Horford without someone on Al Horford's level. And so the big drop off is going to come from beyond the arc. But Xavier Tillman is a very good player. He's on an expiring deal, but figures to be easy to retain. And I would expect that to happen. And so I absolutely think that that was part of the vision here, that there was some long term planning accomplished at the deadline. We talked about Springer and what he brings to the table with his upside as a 21 year old. Xavier Tillman is 25, and I expect him to be here for multiple seasons. I think there's a fair chance that he's able to at least fill a little bit of what Horford does. I don't know if the offensive skill set is there just yet, but right now, I mean, Horford's not being asked to do a whole lot. He's just asked to make almost all the threes, uh, which is not nice. But he's not being asked to create anymore. He's just asked to be a catch, shoot, catch, finish player. And it's not impossible to think Tillman could do that. I'm interested to see if they start kind of looking in the draft for their next Horford guy too, because the draft is going to become increasingly important for the Celtics as we move on here, because the CBA binds these teams that spend money and the Celtics are one of them. I love to say it's not my money, but the league doesn't care if it's my money or not, because they're going to make them not be able to make trades, not be able to uh, have their first round pick be where it should be. It's probably going to fall the last in the round a lot of these years if they spend too much. There's so many restrictions that come along with building a good team. Luckily for the Celtics, they've done it in a way where they can legally keep guys around. They just have to pay them. Tillman, they do have the bird rights. So it isn't crazy to think that they'll, they'll at least investigate whether he can take on a larger role in the sense where he could be Al Horford in the future. I, I'm just curious if it comes to the draft. I think that's a, a realistic option too, but I'm excited to see what we get from Tillman at the very least. Definitely. The only other question I think I see in the chat is about the 15th roster spot. Somebody asked, uh, yep, do we still have a roster spot open? Yes, the Celtics still have a roster spot open. And then somebody else asked about who they should sign, buy up people, uh, who they could get in the buyout market. Um Danilo Gallinari signed with the Bucks. Sam and I recorded a video about him as a buyout target, and then we had to scrap it because he signed with the Bucks 20 minutes later. Unreleased. Uh, and then outside of that, I just I don't know who's like be worth it. Like Daniel House, like if PJ Tucker gets bought out, but I don't really want that Me. attitude to now anymore. Me. Like yeah, I, I don't think Sam, give the guy from the basement a shot. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think uh it matters as much at this point. Bobby, is there anybody you have an eye on or think would be worth it or matters at all? So I asked Brad Stevens about the possibility when we spoke to him the day after the deadline about converting Kata. And he said, look, he's a very good poker player and he has to be diplomatic in that situation. So he said that we're evaluating all options and they've been very impressed by Nimi's development, which is true. But you also, you look at his remaining eligibility and how it takes them through the regular season. And I don't think they're going to end up converting his contract would be my prediction. And when it comes to options, I wrote about them for SI.com. And the, look, none of them are that sexy. Historically, buyout players typically don't move the needle come playoff time. But I do look at going in the direction of someone like Otto Porter, who's won a title, who played against the Celtics in the finals and has some knowledge that could be beneficial. And it's just a savvy, well-respected veteran. So less about what he can do on the court and more about being another coach of sorts. They could also bring back Blake Griffin, who has not said that, hey, I'm walking away from the game for both the vibes and the chemistry and the camaraderie and for a lot of that stuff I just mentioned with Otto Porter. 
And then maybe they decide they want a direction like Furkan Korkmaz, for example, another shooter. And if there's some concern about the ability to retain Sam Hauser long term, maybe you get someone like Korkmaz in the system and you see what happens. Yeah, I, I think you made a great point about the you're going to get more value in whatever leadership slash mentality that they bring to the table rather than somebody actually giving you real minutes because it's just not going to happen on this team. Jack and I have went to all ends of the earth to find somebody that can knock any of the rotation guys out of the rotation. Spoiler alert, there's like nobody out there that's going to do that. It's just not going to happen. Everybody's fitting so well together. There's no need to shake up what you already have. Blake Griffin is the best option. It's just a question of whether he wants to actually play basketball and travel and be away from his family again. And it seems like that answer is no. I'm not sure if there's anybody else out there that's going to be really worth bringing in. Isaiah Thomas is probably not going to happen. Uh, Kemba Walker's playing in Monaco. Just thinking of guys that might want to come back and join the Celtics for a title run. It, it's tough to imagine that they get there with any of them. Yeah, it doesn't seem likely. Uh, but anyways, uh, Birkin, yeah, we did see Lamar uh, in Memphis on fire. Don't worry, we got a video cooking. I think probably tomorrow you'll see something about yeah. that on the channel. Um, Bobby, any final thoughts before we get to trivia? No, Lamar's been awesome, and even Banton is playing well in Portland. So shout out to the two of them for Great. doing well with the opportunity they've been given elsewhere. Yes, sir. All right. Well, in that case, let's get to trivia. The chat's been waiting for it since the very start. Uh, of the stream, I think someone popped in here and said, Literally "I'm just waiting the first for trivia." Message. Yeah, so Love the fans that. want it. Time to give the fans what they want. Michael one one Hulley, series. Let's get here. it. <laughs> one one series here. Sam, Bobby, turn off the chat. Make sure you can't oh, see yes. it. Um, so I will be uh, chat is off. checking it as we go. Okay, question. And I, who won the last one? Sam I won the last did. one. So New Sam will go first. One zero lead. One series win apiece. Through twenty twenty one. Seven different players have scored 45 or more points for the Celtics in a playoff game. Who are those seven players? I'll read it again for the chat, and I'll type it in the chat. Through 2021, seven different players have scored 45 or more points for the Celtics in a playoff games. Who are those seven players? Uh, Isaiah. Correct. Isaiah Thomas. Bobby? Tatum. Correct. All right. Sam, are we going to rapid fire here for a sec? You got another Ray one? Ray Allen. I was just letting you catch up. Thank you. Correct. Bobby. Larry Bird. No. Oh. Oh, it's always a crapshoot. <laughs> uh, I'm going to guess Tommy. He did. No. He was on my... Really? Whoa! I thought, I, thought, I thought he did, and he was on my list. Oh, man, that sucks. John Havlicek. Yeah. I was, I was torn, but I was like, let me go get Tommy. I thought Heinsohn did too. Oh, that's a catastrophe. We have what? Three left? Yeah. Oh, that's terrible. 45 or more. There's one guy that I know was close, but didn't do it. Uh, Did Sam Jones do it? Yes, he did. You know, I got him. I was doing well with the Sam Jones guess in the beginning, but for a while, the answer has been no when I throw him out there. <laughs> Bobby got <laughs> punked off of Sam Jones. No, Burke, and that's not correct. You're missing two more still, uh, everybody. I don't remember this individual doing it, but Paul Pierce? Yeah, he did it. Yes, oh, he did. he did it. He did it. Uh, I held off. He did it against Philly. It, I know it doesn't say on the car, but he did it against Philly like way back, like early in his career. Damn. Oh, one left no, on one the list left. for the win. Picked an odd number too, so we're uh, cooking here. I hate this. This is a catastrophe. I have like two or three guys in mind that I'm just not sure about. 45 no or more. It's not him, Birkin. The chat's guessing along, so I'm answering for them as we go. I, uh, I'm going to guess Bill Russell. Not Bill. Yeah. Bob Cousy. 
Yeah. Let's go. <laughs> Bobby Cousy. Was like, well, Hilly, that was for you. I almost wanted to guys in an NFL <laughs> coin toss, and I just want, wanted to defer. Because <laughs> could have done what the Niners didn't. Bob Guzzi oh. scored 50 points in a playoff game. Rondo 1953. <clears throat> mm. Chris Ford? What kind of guess is that? They just reopened the chat. <laughs> You're not. Did Chris Ford have a monster playoff game? Like 40s? Uh, Chris Ford, no. He scored. He was the first the mo- guy to make a three yeah. in the NBA, right. I believe. I think so. I think that was part of our trivia. I was also, I, was, I wasn't going to guess him, but I was wondering how close McHale got. It's never McHale. The answer is never McHale. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we've learned. McHale had 34. Yeah. So, I mean, 11 is not bad, but I, I knew he wasn't on the list. I was just curious. Mm-hmm. Uh, other players who got close. Rondo did have 44. Larry had 43 was his cap. Oh, Isaiah oh, had 42. Lewis, 42. And yeah. That's so Jaylen impressive that Reggie Lewis in such a short time. Nearly did this. Yeah. Who Jalen have forty against? <laughs> uh, I don't remember that game. Was it in recent? Playoffs? Miami. Twenty twenty two. Was that the one when they everyone made everything? They just smoked. Them? Perhaps it was the one on no. He, he had maybe he, my favorite away play ever. The dunk. My Miami won the game. It's the one where Miami murdered them in the first quarter, thirty nine to eighteen. Game three. Oh, really? He had 40? Mickey yeah. Mouse 40 doesn't count. Uh, I can't see the box score. Yeah, he had 40 in the game. Anyways, Bobby up 2-1 in the uh, trivia series. It's 1-1. Uh, it's 1-1 one one in series, in series oh, and in games yeah, within yeah, this yeah, set. Yeah, yeah, I see. I see. I see. Don't yell at me. I'm trying to body. <laughs> it's not fun. I'm trying to move you at the paint. All right. Um, Palms yeah. Bobby, any final thoughts? Official. Yeah, just, get out of here. Uh, it feels good to get back in the win column. It is one to one in terms of sets, and, and you know we're we're trying to have another parade over here. Vibes were electric that day, so hopefully we can keep this momentum rolling. Yes, sir. All right, chat and everybody watching this video, make sure to check out Bobby's work at si.com/celtics inside the Celtics. There, subscribe to How About Them Celtics on YouTube. How many times can I say Celtics in thirty seconds? Uh, thank you all for tuning in. I'll let Sam wrap it up. Yeah, thank you very much for listening or watching. If you're watching, make sure you subscribe to the channel. Hit the notification bell so you don't miss any of our uploads. We're doing Talk and Seas three days a week, Monday, Wednesday, Wednesday, and Friday. Monday, Friday are live. Wednesday, we'll go out at some point during the day. We're also doing full pods Tuesday, Thursday, Sunday. You don't want to miss those. And any day after a game, we're putting up game recaps. We're also live before every single game a half hour before. Big thanks again to Bobby for joining us. You can follow him on Twitter at Bobby Kravitsky. You can find him on Inside the Celtics for SI Media. He's at all the games, boots on the ground, at practice, all of it. So good coverage coming your way from Bobby. You can also find us on Spotify and Apple. You can follow us there for the audio versions of the pods and game recaps. Leave a five-star review. We'd appreciate it very much. If you want to email us, hbtcpod at gmail.com. We are recording an episode tomorrow at some point so if you want to be featured just send us email share some all-star break thoughts with us we've already gotten a few which is exciting we'll have a good email segment for you there you can find us on socials at how about them sees twitter instagram and tiktok facebook is just name of the podcast if you follow us you're going to get all the streams as well as you will on youtube and also on twitter jack's twitter is at jack's money nba minds at sam lafrance nba it's it for us